It's hot out there, but let's blow them off the line of scrimmage. The man is the kingdom and the power and the glory. No, these are not Viking fans entering Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, Minnesota. They are cowboy fans bundled up in winter gear as Viking weather came south to Texas Stadium. What Dallas fans are accustomed to, however, are championship games, and their cowboys were heavy favorites to defeat the Vikings for the NFC title. While no one figured the purple to be here in the first place, there were some favorable omens for the Vikings. For one, there was the fact that they had never lost an NFC championship game. Secondly, they had never lost to the Cowboys at Texas Stadium. Minnesota was more importantly fired up by the knowledge that no one except themselves wanted them to win. No one wished for a fifth Viking embarrassment in the Super Bowl. While Minnesota may have possessed a psychological edge, the Dallas Cowboys were clearly the superior team. They led the NFL in both offense and defense, and in the playoff game against the Bears, they had won convincingly 37-7. So Dallas appeared ready to turn this game upside down and earn their fourth Super Bowl trip as they met Minnesota in the NFL Game of the Week. Disaster struck the Vikings on the game's third play when Robert Miller fumbled and Dallas recovered. This Dallas defense is called Doomsday Junior by the sports writers and like its parent it is manned by all pros at key positions. Number 79 Harvey Martin has become the superstar of Doomsday and his fumble recovery set up the Cowboys nicely deep inside Minnesota territory. It took Dallas only two plays to convert the turnover into six points as Roger Staubach hit number 83, Golden Richards, on the fly. Richards' touchdown was a variation of a favorite cowboy play. Early in almost any game, Dallas employs a flanker screen, usually to Drew Pearson, number 88. Another angle reveals that Staubach's pump fake to Pearson lured the Viking defense to the decoy. With the purple caught in hot pursuit, Roger lofted a soft throw to the wide open Richards. The stunning precision that Dallas demonstrated with this well-conceived play was not carried over to the conversion as they botched the extra point and led six to nothing. The main thrust of Tom Landry's defense has always been to shut down the opponent's running game. The philosophy of his flex defense is simply this. Once you stop the run, you dictate to the offense when they must pass. Over the last seven years, there has never been a thousand yard rusher to gain over 100 yards in any playoff, championship, or Super Bowl game. Number 44, Chuck Foreman, was not the exception, as Dallas limited him to 59 yards on 21 carries. <laughs> the second phase of their defensive strategy was to take wide receiver Sammy White and number 28, Ahmad Rashad, out of the Vikings game plan. They did so by first bumping them off stride and then abetting that technique with well-designed blitzes that kept quarterback Bob Lee off balance. When Lee was not harassed, he forced his passes into a forest of defenders. Much of their success on defense can be traced in part to the imposing presence of defensive end Ed Tutal Jones, who after four years of fits and bursts of startling potential, has finally begun to measure up to the standards that made him the first choice in the 1974 NFL Draft. While the best years of the Cowboy defense are ahead of them, 
The same cannot be said of the Purple Gang. While they used to bend and break, they never snapped. Now they sometimes do. Facing the Cowboys and Rookie of the Year Tony Dorsett, the Vikings summoned up their time-worn skills and held Dallas in check throughout much of the first half. The Vikings most feared the scrambles of Roger Staubach, so the front four played their rush soft and forced him to run into the hard part of their defense. With Staubach's impromptu runs nipped in the bud and Dorsett limited to nine yards in the first quarter, the Vikings began to frustrate a Dallas team which held a scant six to nothing lead. As the second quarter began, a dreadful scene occurred when a spark caught on a spectator's snowman costume and turned it into flame. But fortunately for Dan Yoder, other spectators smothered the fire with blankets and he was taken to a Dallas hospital and listed in fair condition. Many experts predicted that Viking special teams, so often the key to Minnesota victories, would have to produce a blocked kick in order for them to win. Early in the second period, Dallas turned this tactic to their own advantage when punter Danny White caught Minnesota in a wide rush and ran 14 yards for a first down. Another look at White's run reveals that he took one quick look and seeing nothing but an open field and an uncontested opportunity for an easy first down, folded to the sideline. White's run and a later interference penalty set up the Cowboys for the game's second score. A determined five-yard run by number 44, Robert Newhouse. Newhouse's touchdown gave Dallas a 13-0 pad, but Minnesota quickly fought back when Lee threw long to Sammy White, and number 31, Benny Barnes, was called for interference. Minnesota's drive for a touchdown went a glimmering when a third down sack on Lee by Randy White forced the Vikings to settle for a field goal. Trailing 13-3, Minnesota began to pour into Roger Staubach's pass pocket and turned the usually clockwork perfect offense into a helter-skelter scattershot affair. Except for the game's second play, the touchdown pass to Golden Richards, the Viking defense had held firm and they seemed only to need a lucky bounce of the ball to turn this game around. However, this was not to be a fortunate day for the Vikings as once again when they were within sight of a touchdown, Lee fumbled. Although Minnesota recovered, the missed opportunity led not to six points but to three and they trailed Dallas 13 to six. With less than two minutes to play in the half, Roger Staubach was finally able to whip the Cowboys downfield.
In these situations, Staubach invariably looks for number 26, Preston Pearson. Pearson is like the sixth man in pro basketball, someone able to come off the bench cold and heat up the offense in the clutch. Looking at the play again in super slow motion illustrates that Staubach used an old-fashioned jump pass to set up a seldom used middle screen. The rest was vintage Pearson as he followed and kicked past his blockers for a 32-yard gain. Although he was a starter for nine games this season until Tony Dorsett replaced him, Pearson is even more valuable as a situation substitute who can read and react to the most sophisticated pass coverages. The closest Dallas came to a touchdown on this drive came when a Staubach rainbow to Golden Richards caught the little receiver astride out of bounds. With only five seconds remaining, the Cowboys salvaged three points as Efren Herrera's field goal built the Dallas margin to 16 to six at the half. Although their lead was only 10 points, the Cowboys expressed the confident feeling that it would take the second coming of the Ice Age to stay their bid for the NFC Championship and a trip to Super Bowl XII. With Dallas Doomsday Jr. completely dominating the first half and the Cowboys in the lead 16-6, Minnesota and their quarterback Bob Lee began the third quarter by taking to the air. Lee throwing a semi-spiral 28 yards upfield to number 85, Sammy White. But that would be it in this series for the Vikings as the Dallas defense regrouped and once again played the tough, tenacious brand of defense they had displayed in the first half. Chuck Foreman continued to be shut off on the ground, so Lee tried short, safe passes to both flanks, but the Cowboy cornerbacks covered quickly. Viking defense played well throughout the third quarter, closing down on Tony Dorsett and Roger the Dodger when he attempted to scramble. Throughout the second half, both putters played a key role with the Cowboys' young Danny White outdueling his Vikings counterpart Neil Claybo by a large margin. He drove the Vikings deeper and deeper toward their own goal with his booming kicks and continually left the Vikes with poor field position. Claybo, a three-year veteran from Tennessee, suffered in comparison, punting for 30, 31, and 34 yards twice in the second half and failing to hit the coffin corner on a number of occasions. Late in the third period, after a four Claybo punt gave Dallas good field position, the Cowboys hit on their first big play of the half when Drew Pearson took a pass over the middle for 28 yards to the Minnesota 12-yard line. The pass came on a third and 20 situation and was a typical Staubach to Pearson pressure hookup. But this excellent opportunity was squandered on the very next play when Tony Dorsett coughed up the football and the Vikings recovered on the 12. It was the first of two turnovers that would hamper Dallas in the second half. But Bob Lee, ever aware of the Dallas pass rush, couldn't move his team out of danger and with Minnesota forced to punt from its own end zone, 
it appeared the Cowboys would get the ball in good field position. But on the punt, rookie Dave Stalls, number 65, was flagged for a roughing play bow, and Minnesota had a new life. On third and three, number 83, Stu Voigt, worked his way free, but dropped Lee's accurate pass, and the Vikings were forced to punt again. From close to his own end zone, Claybo again got off a short putt, only 31 yards. And rookie Tony Hill with a huge hurdle brought it back 16 yards. Staubach quickly improved Dallas position by firing a strike to Drew Pearson over the middle for 19 yards, despite close coverage. But once again, with the Cowboys seemingly poised for the kill, a turnover ruined their chances. Rogers' rollout pass for Dupree was tipped and intercepted by Nate Wright, number 43. And the Dallas drive ended at the Minnesota 4. Continuing their offensive ineptitude, thanks largely to Dallas' flex defense, the Vikings putted for the seventh time in the game. Claybo finally getting off a boomer of 54 yards. But unfortunately for Minnesota, number 80 Tony Hill was the recipient. The rookie from Stanford returned the kick 20 twisting yards, and although the Cowboys failed to take advantage of his contribution and went nowhere this series, Hill had showcased the talent that makes him the finest natural athlete on the entire team, and a player who will see much more action at wide receiver next season. Late in the final quarter, another punt proved to be one of the key plays in this championship game. With White punting from his end zone, Minnesota's chance at good position was ruined when Manford Moore was met with a shattering tackle by Thomas Henderson and was separated from the ball, which was recovered by Jay Saldi. Now with another excellent shot, this time from the Viking 35, Dallas finally capitalized on the opportunity. Robert Newhouse was the big man on this drive, running three times for a total of 23 yards. Newhouse, the often overlooked other back in the Cowboys' backfield, was superb today, outgaining Dorsett 90 yards to 71. Now with 3.59 showing on the stadium clock and the score standing at the same 16-6 it did since the second quarter, Dallas put the game away. From the Viking 11, the call was two doors set, and the rookie running back skirted the right flank and just made it across the flag for the clinching touchdown. On the play, Dallas had been in their shotgun formation, Staubach handing to Dorsett, who got up ahead of steam and wouldn't be denied. Somehow it was appropriate that Dorsett, the NSC Rookie of the Year, should score the deciding six points in this championship game. For touchdown, Tony has made a big difference in this 1977 edition of the Dallas Cowboys. The highly publicized Heisman Trophy winner from the University of Pittsburgh came to this club amid a swirl of hoopla and high hopes. But any fears that he would clash with the Cowboys' team concept were quickly laid to rest, for Dorsett has fit in beautifully. Now trailing by 17, Minnesota got the ball for the final time today. Certain defeats staring Bud Grant and the Vikings in the face. Obviously, there would be no fifth Super Bowl for Minnesota. Fittingly, the Vikings' final try was snuffed out by the doomsday defense. And with over two minutes left to play, the Cowboy attack easily ran out the clock as the heroes from defense celebrated on the sideline.
Dallas had won this National Conference Championship game, and they won it convincingly, limiting Chuck Foreman and company to merely 66 yards rushing and two field goals. Tom Landry's young, proud, and intricate flex destroyed the Minnesota machine, and as they predicted, stopped their chief threat, Chuck Foreman. The Viking superstar was limited to just 59 yards on the ground, following in the footsteps of Walter Payton, who managed just 60 yards in the first round of the playoff. So after 16 weeks, the Dallas Cowboys have emerged as the best team in the National Conference, and for the fourth time will appear in the Super Bowl. By you bow, they'll return to New Orleans, the site of their only Super Bowl win six years ago. On January 15th in the Superdome, the Denver Broncos will be the target as Dallas draws a bead on their second Super Bowl trophy.